So this week, uh, the first photos were released from the James Webb Telescope. Uh, looked a little something like this. And this uh, astronomical society took that image and then placed it on a map of the rest of what we see in space. And it, yeah, that's what I was letting you know. <laughs> it's a little unsettling there. Uh, so you can see that uh, the way it was described by Neil deGrasse Tyson was, if you took a grain of sand and held it at arm's length, it would completely obscure that photograph, that image that was taken by that satellite, right? And so uh, all of those galaxies you see, some of the, that star with kind of the spikes on it, that's actually a foreground image that's out of focus. We're looking past that. We're interested in the other things. Some of the little galaxies that almost look like crescents, uh, that's a result of their light being distorted by gravity as it travels through space-time, something that Einstein had predicted. But yeah, we can see all sorts of cool things that we have never seen before. And, and we live in a visible universe that is 93 billion light years in diameter. And so it's this massive, massive space. And so I'm going to ask us this question today. I've got two questions for us. The first one is, where are we in this universe? And to begin to answer that question, I've got a short, like, three and a half minute video that we're going to play. So we'll watch that right here. Here we go. Where are you? Where is this place you're occupying? Somewhere in a room, maybe in a city, on a continent, on a planet orbiting a star in a galaxy among billions. But where is all of that? Your position on what feels like a flat surface but is actually a sphere. But this sphere is always moving, never staying in one position. Earth is orbiting a star, the Sun at the center of the solar system. First of all, our orbit really is an ellipse, so we spend half the year sinking a little bit closer to the sun, speeding up, and half the year rising up a bit and slowing down. And in another cycle of 112,000 years, the ellipse itself is drifting, which at least creates a beautiful shape. In the end, we get an orbital path that looks like a wobbly circle with wavy edges. And it gets worse as the moon now starts to mess things up too. As the Moon is a pretty massive thing, it pulls on Earth. Both objects orbit their common center of gravity that lies around 4,700 kilometers off to the side of Earth's core. In practice, this means that as the Moon orbits Earth, it's jerking Earth around a bit, enough to make it jiggle. Okay, so you're standing on the surface of a rotating planet that is jiggling around the Sun in an elliptical orbit that changes a bit every year. But who's to say the Earth is right? From the perspective of the Sun, the plane of the solar system is arbitrary. It's defined as the plane the Earth orbits in because that is convenient for us. In reality, the other planets are just a little bit inclined with respect to our plane. From their point of view, we're the ones with a slightly bent orbit. But this isn't it. Far from it. The solar system as a whole is orbiting the center of the Milky Way galaxy. If we look at the Milky Way, we can clearly make out a galactic plane in which the solar system orbits the center every 230 million years. But of course, it's not that simple. First of all, the plane of the solar system is not aligned with the plane of the galaxy. Nothing really is. Just like the planets in the solar system orbit the sun on their own planes, so do all the stars orbiting the galactic center. The solar system as a whole is tilted about 60 degrees towards the galactic plane, speeding through space at almost a million kilometers per hour. Someone in the center of the galaxy would see the orbits of the planets moving through space in a helix shape, which you can imagine as a corkscrew motion on the tilted plane of the solar system relative to the plane of the galaxy. This orientation in space means that sometimes the planets are sort of in front of the sun as it orbits around the galactic core. Let's just look at this for a moment. There is a strange and eerie beauty about how our planets and the sun move through space. Do you feel a bit dizzy? It gets worse. This is still not the whole story because the mass of the galactic disk is constantly pulling on the solar system too. Like a drunk dolphin, we're diving down and shooting up hundreds of light years through the galactic plane ten times every orbit along arcs thousands of light years long. We haven't mapped this motion out completely, as it takes the solar system tens of millions of years to go up and back once, and, well, humanity is not that old. Let's look at your relative position again. On a planet, tilted towards the sun, jiggled around by the moon, 
in a solar system tilted towards the galactic plane, moving forward in a helical shape, diving up and down through the plane. The Milky Way is part of a galaxy group that appears to be part of greater structures like the Laniakea supercluster, which itself is part of the gigantic Pisces Cetus supercluster complex, and finally a galactic filament that spans hundreds of millions of light years in all directions and orientations. We've reached the end of our little exercise in cosmic humidity. Let's make the journey backwards again, from the indescribably large, to the really large, to our galactic home, to our galaxy, to the solar system diving up and down through the Milky Way, to the jiggle of existence. And finally, back to you right now, watching this video. We live out, right, perhaps a hundred or so years of our life on that spinning planet wobbled by the moon, right, revolving around the sun, spinning through the Milky Way galaxy that's right, traveling in its local group through the Linakia supercluster, right, in the Pisces Cetus supercluster complex nebula, right? And so, like, that's your whole life is actually going to travel a very minute distance of the path that our planet travels throughout the universe that God has made. And even that one galaxy is one of the many, many, many that we saw in that James Webb photograph. And so that's your life. That's where you are. That's where I am. And now let's ask the second question today. Where is God? Where is God? Because David, the psalmist, he actually phrased what feels like contradictory ideas. In Psalm 51, 11, the psalmist says, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Almost suggesting that you could be at some time in your life or perhaps for all of eternity, away from the presence of God. But then elsewhere in Psalm 139, 7, he says, where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? As if David, if he spent all of his energy running from God, he couldn't succeed in that mission. Right? If we were to, as our planet, like take all of the resources on our planet and build a rocket and try to fly away from God's presence, right? we wouldn't make it very far. We wouldn't make it out of our solar system. We wouldn't make it across the Milky Way galaxy. We wouldn't make it in the local group, anywhere like that. We couldn't get away from the presence of God if we tried. And so this is this weird idea that God is somehow everywhere where he can't be avoided, but also it's possible to be far from God at the same time. Somewhat unusual, somewhat unusual. Now, as far as God being omnipresent, this is the, the theological idea that we've had throughout right, Christian history, is that God is at all places, at all times, that he is present throughout his universe that he's made and beyond the universe that he's made because he pre-existed space and time and matter right, that he made. And so God is everywhere, but also in the scriptures we see this weird thing where sometimes he has a focused presence. Uh, I'll call it perhaps an attentional presence where like he's, he's really paying attention or he's really present. I don't know if I could describe it accurately as the density of God is uh, at a greater capacity in a local region. And we see this, for instance, when God would walk with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day, or when God traveling with the Israelites through the wilderness, right? He's this displayed as this pillar of smoke or this pillar of fire that is the presence of God in the midst of their camp leading them on this journey. Or when the Ark of the Covenant is formed, right, his spirit, his presence dwells in between the cherubim above the Ark of the Covenant. The presence of God is somehow concentrated, or like I said, more densely located in those regions. And even in the building of the tabernacle or the temple eventually, there was kind of the outer courts where you're getting closer to this presence of God, uh, and it gets a little more dangerous, and then inner courts, and then the Holy of Holies, this place where only the high priest could go once a year. And so it, it seems as though, while God exists everywhere, he also sometimes is particularly attentive. He's particularly present in a moment, in a location, uh, in this unusual way. And so we're going to tease out some of these ideas, as well as considering how you could be far from God or near to God while God simultaneously is everywhere. It's kind of unusual, right? Uh, but first, let's consider this. Now, 
typically, God describes himself as being far from those who are wicked. Okay, this is Proverbs 15, 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. All right, that those who are perhaps fleeing from God, running from God, living life their own way, uh, that God is distant from them in some way, while still being in the same room and in the midst of every atom that they've ever been around, right? And so, but nonetheless, the scriptures describe perhaps relationally that God is far from the wicked. And actually, sometimes he draws near to the wicked in moments of, of judgment, which I know is something that makes us feel uncomfortable, right? But nonetheless, the Bible and Jesus speak of these things. I, I compare it to this, like as a teacher in my math classroom, if there's like a group of students that are chatting or getting distracted with something, I might continue to teach the lesson while I draw near to them. And just sometimes my presence getting close to them causes them to realize, right? Like, oh, he knows what we're doing. And they might, that, that drawing near might in itself be sufficient to correct their behavior, right? And so, so like, just like drawing near, like I knew what they were doing, but now they know that I know what they were doing, right? So that sort of thing. And we see God actually uh, reveal his presence in different ways throughout the history of scripture. In the case of the Tower of Babel, in Genesis 11, verse 5, it says, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. And so in this moment of, of humanity's rebellion against God, he shows up in a greater present way amongst the wicked for the sake of judgment. Or in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, all right, as he's talking with Abraham uh, in Genesis 18, it says, then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done all together according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. All right, and so God's showing up. He's, he's paying greater attention to the details of what's going on, which unfortunately for them means greater judgment, right? It's like God's paying attention to what's happening in their city. And never mind just, uh, right, the Tower of Babel or Sodom and Gomorrah, these pagan cities, but even in his own nation of Israel, when he brings judgment against them for rebelling against him, it says this in the book of Malachi. Who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. And in verse 5, he says, Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be swift, a swift witness against the sorceresses, uh, the sorcerers, the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. And so even though God is present everywhere, sometimes he draws near for the sake of judgment, which is not something that we would want him to do for us. And, and what's unusual is that there's actually even this future judgment that Jesus describes, in which somehow the wicked are, even though God is far from them relationally right now, he will be further from them in the future in some way. Uh, Jesus, when asked the question, will many be saved? He said this, ver, uh, Luke 13, verse 24, strive to enter through the narrow door. And he's describing himself. He's the only means by which we can be forgiven and freed from slavery to sin. He says, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door <coughs> and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you. I do not know where you come from. And then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. 
And so somehow, even in their lifetime, they've experienced some proximity to Christ or the gospel or to God's presence. But yet, in eternal judgment, they will be cast out, told to depart from his presence, even though they enjoyed the teaching of God's scripture, right? Even though they, this might even be describing the generation in which Jesus came to live on the earth and to teach correctly the word of God, right? There were, were villages that were visited by Jesus that are farther from God than you have ever been, right? Like that they are still far from God because you and I, 2,000 years later, although we're not enjoying the, the earthly ministry of Jesus in that sense, because of what he's done for us, because of his Holy Spirit dwelling within us, we can be closer to God than they ever were, even though he was doing miracles in their midst and teaching in their streets. Now, Jesus then goes on in further detail, uncomfortably for us. He preaches harder than I do. Verse 28, he says, in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out, right? So once again, depart from me, this cast out language that there is this future loss of the presence of God or his common grace that they now experience on the earth. Verse 29, it says, and people will come from east and west and north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And so even though some are cast aside, others will draw near from all tribes and tongues and nations, the Bible describes, right? The invitation is broad, that we can actually be in the kingdom of God, eating at the table of the kingdom of God. And this is God's desire. This is his will. This is what he wants for all humanity. This is why he came to die and offer this invitation to all people. And in verse 34 of the same chapter, Jesus says this as he's looking at the city he's about to die in. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often I would have gathered you uh, together as you're gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. And so, once again, God's desire, Jesus' mission on the earth was to come and gather people, to draw them into him, into relationship with the Father that can only be attained through him, the one mediator once and for all, right? And so God's desire is to gather, and some people are unwilling. They're pushing him away, and sadly, when eternity comes, God will give in to their wishes. God will give in to their will and say, all right, like, then depart from me. I cast you off, leave, right? You're not in the kingdom, right? Once again, this is uncomfortable. But as far as the presence of God, right now it's a blessing that all people enjoy in some capacity. Or Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians 1, this is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. All right, and part of these passages, the reason that they seem harsh to us and didn't necessarily to the churches they were written to is because they were churches that are persecuted, much so, in a different way than we are. And so we're not necessarily crying out for justice in the same way that they were as they're oppressed. All right. And so he recognizes that this people are suffering. Verse six, he says, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, those who do not obey the gospel, the good news of what Jesus came to do. He says they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. And here's the, the phrase that I wanted us to look at, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Right, and so part of this judgment is this being sent away, being told to depart, uh, experiencing justice for your sins away from the presence of God. And so that's why when he comes and during our lifetime, he desires that we would come near to him and experience the mercy that he has for, it, for us. Verse 10 says, right, when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed, he's going to be in our midst because our testimony to you was believed. 
And right, and so this is uncomfortable, right? This is unsettling, the idea of this future judgment. Right now, all people enjoy the presence of God and the common grace that he has in his creation. But they, if they repeatedly reject, refuse to turn to him, right, he will one day approve of their will and say, all right, you're going to be set aside away from my presence, which is what you wished for your entire life. But I want to let you know, even wicked cities, God loves and cares for and reaches out to and offers repentance. Consider the story of Jonah, Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. And so here's a wicked city, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's sending a reluctant prophet to go and tell them to repent, to address their sin. And he's doing this because he wants them to turn from their sin. He, he delights in repentance and not judgment, not the death of the wicked. But verse 3, it says, But Jonah, this is peculiar, rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. And so we just a moment ago, we're talking about, right, like God is present everywhere in his creation. So what's Jonah doing? Like, how do you run from the presence of the Lord? And he knows the Lord. He's a, he's a Hebrew. He's a follower of Yahweh. And he didn't like the instructions he was told to. He wanted to see that city judged for their evil. And he knew that God was going to be merciful and forgive them when they turned. And right, and so he runs from the presence of the Lord. And so he can't get away from God's presence in the sense of God's omnipresence. So maybe he's describing getting away from among the people of God those who had access to God, those who through sacrifices would uh, approach God, right? Getting as far away from the altar and the offerings that were made so that the people could have relationship with God. That, that's probably what it's talking about because in verse 9, he knows that God is omnipresent. It says, he said to him, uh, to them, that is the crew, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. He's like, I know God made all of these things, right? There's not really a version of me getting away from that version of God's presence. And then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And so Jonah knew that God dwells in heaven, dwells in the sea and the dry land, that God exists everywhere. And God continues to prove that to Jonah by even right, eventually sending the great fish to swallow him up, and God even hears his repentant prayers in the depths of the sea. God is present in all of these places, but yet, relationally, sometimes people try to run from God, right? Even his own children that have had relationship, we go through seasons where we, we just kind of want to avoid, we know the truth, but we want to not think about it right now, like we want to go do our own thing because we know what the scripture says is true. And that's what Jonah was trying to do. He was trying to run. David also talked about the presence of the Lord in this way uh, when he was in exile out of Israel. Okay? He said this to, uh, to Saul when he was being hunted. 1 Samuel 26, 20. Now, therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. And so, so David, when he was away from Israel, living amongst the Philistines, he, was, he felt that there was this gap. He felt that he was away from God's people, away from the tabernacle, away from access to celebrating the feasts and the, the festivities and the sacrifices amongst God's people. He, he noticed he was missing out on something when he was away from the, the attentive presence of God among Israel. And about 32 years later, he ends up singing this psalm in Psalm 41. He says, But you, Lord, have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. All right, and so, so he recognizes that right, there's a way that he can never get out of God's presence, but also when he's away from the people of God that somehow he's missing some aspect of God's presence that should be enjoyed, and he celebrates that thing. 
And so, 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 so far what we've seen is it's possible to relationally be far from God. It's possible to be uh, far from the people of God where his attentive presence might be. But we can never really get away from his omnipresence. It's not as though there's pockets of the universe where he's not paying attention or he's blind to or like he doesn't like I'm going to hide my sin over here and he's never going to find out. No, there's no no version of that. He sees all of it that God dwells within all of his creation. And so let's go to that Psalm 139. I read part of it for us earlier. Psalm 139, verse 7. This is once again David. He says, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, that is the grave, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your, right, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Right? He's recognizing wherever I go, God, like you're there already. You're waiting for me to show up, right? Like tapping your foot like David. I knew you were going to show up here. Like I've been here the whole time and I've been with you the whole time. Right? Like there's no version of running from God. There's no little pocket of the universe that we can be kings of and make our own and rule according to our own authority. That doesn't exist. He says this even, verse 11, If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. And so David realizes, no matter where I go, God is already there. There's no version of me running from God and dwelling somehow apart from him. That I can't do that. But yet, what's even inter more interesting is that God always knows where we are. And he knows the first moment that we first showed up to exist. He knows from right, the moment of conception to the moment of going to Sheol, right, he is, he's been there and he is already present there. Right? He's, he's forever there. He, he knows all of it. He exists through all of it. He, he was there before we showed up and he'll exist, so to speak, after we're dead. Right? That, that's what it's going to be. And so this is what he goes to next in verse 13. He says, for you, God, this is one of the reasons why I, he realizes I can't hide from you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. Right? God knows where you are. He knows where you, you, everywhere you'll ever be. Everywhere you've ever been. Right? God knows. He was there when you first showed up as a single cell in your mother's womb. He was attentive in that moment, paying attention to the details and assembling us and all of our unformed parts. It says, my frame, in verse 15, was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. Okay, and so... As far as where we are, we watched that little video where we're spinning and wobbling and going around the galaxy, all of these things, right? God knows exactly where you are. God is present with you in whatever situation you find yourself in. He's not surprised by any of it. There's, every time we thought we've been able to hide, every time we thought we've been alone, we haven't been. That he's with us. He was with us before our parents even knew we were there. Right? He's been with us, and he will always be with us in that sense. I like this passage in, in Jeremiah 23, as far as evidence of God dwelling throughout his creation. All right? He says, Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and, and not a God far away? Right? It's kind of phrased weird. He's like, am I a God that's at hand, that's close, and and at the same time, not far away at the same moment? Okay, let's, let's keep reading. Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, de declares the Lord. All right, so God's saying, he's like, I exist everywhere. I am close to you, and I'm, I'm way far away from you at the same moment. I'm, I'm saturating all of it. The New Living Translation says it this way, Am I a God who is only close at hand? No, I am far away at the same time. All right, so God is everywhere. 
His presence fills all of his creation. And so that should be, well, discouraging to us if we're doing wrong, but encouraging to us when we're suffering and need his attention to our prayers. Right? God is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. And this is one of the things I want to pay, uh, look at is that God has a comforting presence at work as well. It's not as though he's like uh, simultaneously looking at the forest and missing the trees, right? He knows what's going on in the details as well. And he knows when we're hurting. He knows this. In Psalm 34, 18, just as, right, we've read that he'll draw near to the wicked in times of judgment, he also draws near to us when we need his comfort. It says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. When we sometimes feel alone, when we're hurting, when we don't understand why the universe is acting the way it is or why our lives are the way they are, right? God is present in those moments. He is near to the brokenhearted. Or in Psalm 46, verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. All right, God is particularly present in the moments when we need him most. He's not ignoring your situation, all right? He is with you in the midst of it all. Or in Matthew 28, we had read this last week, Jesus saying, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All right, that, that when God sends us on a, mission, Jonah, right? He's going to be with you the whole time. When God sends his church out into this world, he is with you to the end of the age. We're not alone in the task that God has given us, that God is present when we do things that are unseen by all people, right? Jesus in Matthew 6 talks about when we pray or when we fast or when we're generous and give in secret, that our God sees in secret and will reward us. Even when no one else appreciates what you're doing, God is there and he's with you while you are loving your neighbor and loving him at the same time. God's paying attention. And right, Christ is present so much when we serve and love our neighbor that we read this a few weeks ago that when he separates the goat from the sheep and all of that, he says, I, not only was he there when we fed or clothed or gave cup of water to or visited the sick or those in prison. But he says, I was the one you were serving. He is so close in the moments when we are representing his kingdom and being a light to this world that he is receiving it as though it's him that we are blessing. That's how close he is. That's how present he is in moments of our going out into the world to bring forth his kingdom. God is also present in his church. And perhaps you've been in moments in church when like the sermon isn't always as heavy as mine has been so far, right? And you're like uplifted and excited and like, I feel the presence of God. Or when the, the music is hopping and you're like, our emotions kind of get going and we're loving God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And our soul is the thing that's particularly receiving that presence of God, right? We've been in moments like that. But I want to let you know, God is also present in churches in like the most uncomfortable church scenario. All right, look at this from 1 Timothy 5, okay? Uh, this is Paul writing to Timothy about when, when a pastor of a church has failed morally in the absolute worst way possible and needs to be corrected in front of everybody, right? Imagine a church service like that, and you'd be like, that doesn't feel like a great church service, <laughs> right? That's not a, a thing that I enjoy. This isn't something that is pleasant I don't feel like God is present in this moment. I just came to show up to sing happy songs, right, is what you might be thinking. But that's not the way that Paul thinks about it. He says this. He says, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. And as for those who persist in sin, a pastor of a church who's unrepentant of the wrong he's doing, he says, rebuke them in the presence of all, right, so that the rest may stand in fear. And notice verse 21. He is both writing this and instructing them to obey this, not just in the presence of believers, but he says, in the presence of God 
and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. And so even in like the most uncomfortable church service you could imagine, where like a pastor's sinned and is rightly being corrected, right? God's present in that moment because Jesus loves his church. And when the church is abused or mistreated, he cares about that, right? And he will correct that behavior. It's important to him, right? That the Holy Spirit inspired this to be written in the scriptures for us. This is a big deal, and he's present even in those weighty, uncomfortable moments in church. But typically, that's not what church is like, right? Typically, we come into the presence of the Lord celebrating, because the, the good news is what we proclaim, even though there's sad parts to that news. All right, it's the good news that we celebrate. David talks about it this way in Psalm 95 too. He says, let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. All right, that when we gather with the people of God, and he would have been talking about the tabernacle, right? Not yet the temple at that point. But for us, it would be like gathering as believers Right, that let us get together and sing songs of praise with hearts of gratitude before the Lord. That there's something about the presence of God being particularly present, right, in moments of the gathering of believers. And he's saying, this is how we do it. We're also warned in scripture that sometimes people come to a gathering like that uh, superficially, right? Jesus harped on this with the religious Pharisees who tried to look good while having hearts that were far from God. This is what, he, what it says in Isaiah, and Jesus quoted this. And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, well, their heart is far from me. And their, the, their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. All right, and so what's interesting is it's possible to try to appear like we're drawing close to God while secretly keeping our hearts as far away from him as possible. Right? Like that, that's something to be aware of, right? Well, simultaneously living in a universe that he fully inhabits at all times, right? It's so, so it's weird. Like you can have your heart far away from God. And so you might think like, as you read that, like, man, I hope, I, I mean, I hope that I'm not that way. Like, I know that I stumble, I sin. Like if, if I'm coming to God, if I'm coming to, to hear from his word, if I'm coming to worship and sing songs, am I a hypocrite? Like, am I disingenuous? Like, is God displeased? But I want to let you know that even sinners, which, by the way, is all of us, Jesus was the only one that is good, right? He invites us to draw near to him, just to do it in an authentic way. In Hebrews 4, it says this, Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay, the, the purpose of Jesus' death on the cross was to make a way for sinners to receive mercy and grace. Right? This, this is his, de his design, his intent. He's not unaware of what we've done wrong. He died for us well knowing we were sinners to show his love for us. He's not unaware when we've stumbled since we've come to him. And his throne is intended to be accessed specifically when we need that mercy and grace, which is when we've stumbled. And we're not supposed to approach his throne timidly or afraid or just like, like, whoa, whatever, like, ah, oh, no, he probably doesn't want to see me for a week or so, that's fine, he's probably angry. No, 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 we're instructed to, with confidence, boldly go before his throne of grace. That when we've stumbled as believers, he still loves us that day just as much as he did the day he chose to die for us. And I want to let you know, he knows the sins that you don't even yet know you will commit in your lifetime, and he still loves you. All right, and so just authentically draw near to the Lord. That's what we're instructed to do. Hebrews 7, 25. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since 
He always lives to make an intercession for them. Right? God loves you. God's made a way for you to be saved, and he wants you to draw near. Or James 4, 8, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So it's not like just being the Pharisees where you have your hand-washing rituals and ceremonies to try to look good. No, no, no. Your heart needs to be a part of this as well. And when we draw near to God, he draws near to us at the same time. Like the prodigal son who is out in a faraway country, sit, sitting in the pigsty, eating seed pods, and he comes to his senses. He's like, I got to go back to my dad's house. And then he starts drawing near to his father. And when on the horizon, the dad sees him coming, he's drawing near. The dad starts running toward his son. Because the son was both far from him in terms of distance and previously was far from him in terms of his heart. That even when the son lived in the house of the father, even when the father had given him his inheritance ahead of time, right? Like he knew that his son's heart was far away from them even when they were in the same room. But the moment he sees his son on the horizon, that means his son in his own heart and mind has come to his senses and now he's drawing near to me. And now I run to him and put a robe on him, put a ring on him and throw a feast and celebration because all of heaven rejoices when one sinner repents. And this is the way that Jesus would describe it, all right? Uh, also, John the Baptist, Jesus kind of preached his sermon as well. In Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, right? Turn from living life your own way, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, so, so in moments where you feel so far from God, or when you've been running for God for months and years, decades of your life spent running from God, no matter how far you have run, you are within a, a hand's reach to instantly be in his kingdom. All right? Like you can't get far enough away that you're not more than one step away from being back in his presence. All right? That's what, what, what's at play here. And so, so Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is so close that if you're willing, he will gather you close to him as a hen does her brood, right? Like that's, he, like it's, it's, it's up to us. It's up to you when you choose, right? I'm going to, I'm going to draw near to God. I'm going to repent. I'm going to trust in him and boom, instantly his kingdom, you are there. Born of the spirit, born again, able to see his kingdom and enjoy his kingdom for all of eternity, right? It, it, it's that quick. It's that quick. And I want to let us know that in this life we can enjoy his presence. He's with us to the end of the age, but yet there is, there is yet a future revelation, a future closeness that we have not yet experienced. A, a time in which we will see him as he is more fully, that we will be closer to him than we are now even. And in Psalm 16, we'll end on this verse, the last one there, David. He says, you make known to me the path of life, in your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Okay, that, that in the presence of God, that's where he wants us to dwell for all of eternity. And he's made a way possible for that to happen, right? That he desires to be with us, not just in this life, but forever, right? God spent six days creating the garden and the universe and everything, the, the 93 billion light year across universe that we live in. He's, he did that in six days. And since Jesus has ascended, he has gone to prepare a place for you that where you are, he may be, uh, you may be also. Where he is, you may be also. All right, so he, he created all of this universe in six days. And for the last 2,000 years or so, he's been creating a space where we can dwell in his presence and enjoy the pleasure of being with him to a level of fullness that we've never, never appreciated yet. All right, and so there's actually a greater version of his presence that is in our future, yet we can still experience a portion of his kingdom right now. So let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, for the, the aspects of this world that are good, the good world that you've made for us to even enjoy. We thank you, Lord, that, that you reveal yourself and who you are, your divine nature, uh, and all of these attributes of yourself in the very things that you've made in this universe, that you can be found everywhere in the universe that you've made and you desire to be known you desire to reveal yourself to humanity you you came to to dwell among us in the body of christ you came to tabernacle among humanity you you set aside the glory of your deity as, as you became a human being in the form of jesus so that you could be close to us in a way that you had not yet been and that through your life on this earth, through your death on the cross, and through your resurrection, you made it possible for us to become cleansed and purified and made righteous when we had always been sinners. And that because we've been sanctified, you can dwell so close to us that your Holy Spirit now indwells us as a temple. Lord, we thank you that, that we live in the world that you've made and that you live in us because of what you've done for us. And we thank you, Lord, that in the future we can enjoy an even greater closeness to you, an even greater revelation of who you are as you draw closer to us, not for the sake of judgment, but for the sake of blessing us and loving us and feasting with us in the kingdom of God. And Lord, we just pray that, that you would remind us of these truths that you would, you would send us out as your church to invite people from the north, south, east, and west, people from every tribe and tongue and nation, that they are not far from you, that they can reach out and experience your goodness and your mercy at any moment. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.